Hi, everyone. Great to see all of you. Um, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. I'm Jessica Lindell. I lead our education and workforce and social impact work here at Unity. I have to do a shout out to Rachel and Kevin, who are on my team, who would love to connect with any of all, and all of you, and myself as well. Um, we're really thrilled to uh, be joined today by this esteemed panel. Um, when I was digging into and creating this panel, the key words that stood out for me were immersive, gamifying, impact, and scale. Um, so those are the, the questions that we're going to be covering and, and the topics. Um, many of you I recognize and have been with us on this journey for many years. Um, so if there are additional topics you want me to add in, raise your hand and we'll do it impromptu. Otherwise, we'll keep it for those and then we'll open it up for, for Q&A as we continue going forward. Um, okay, just in the interest of time, I'm going to take the opportunity to introduce our panel and anything else you want to know about their background, you can multitask and look on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, so starting on the far end, we've got Danielle Rourke uh, here with us from CDW, which I think is really exciting that CDW is investing and creating a eSports uh, group that Danielle is leading um, as the national eSports manager. <laughs> Um, next to Danielle, we've got Doug Donovan, the CEO and co-founder of Interplay Learning. Um, so for those of you who don't know Interplay Learning, it's made with Unity, um, but that's not our favorite part about it. Um, Doug has actually been in this work for almost 15 years at this point, um, really focusing on the intersection of simulations um, and workforce and employee training. So really kind of that adult learning employee training area. Um, and then next to Doug, we've got Cindy Johansson, the executive director of the George Lucas Education Foundation, which as you'll be hearing from Cindy, they're continuing to make a move around how do we really engage K-12 students um, with a focus on simulations. And then last but not least, Matt Dalio, longtime friend and colleague um, in this space, um, the, found, the founder of Endless, which I think Matt will do a better job of describing than I will, but <laughs> really it is um, bringing together just the incredible opportunity of games and learning, accessibility, reach, and then preparing young people and young adults for jobs of the 21st century. So thanks so much for joining me today. Um, all right, so we're going to start off um, with a question on how do you define immersive learning? So I'll start with you, Matt. Tough question. I was hoping you wouldn't speak to me on that one. <laughs> um, so we, we look at games and learning on both sides. I'll, I'll speak briefly about the one that people think of more often, which is the act of playing a game to learn. And, and basically, games are giant learning engines, right? You step in not knowing what to do, and then you get better at whatever the game mechanic is, and then you beat the big boss, and then you go to the next level. And so that <clears throat> the act of playing a game can be um, wildly educational. But the one I want to talk a little bit more about today is the act of actually building a game to learn. And the immersive experience of diving into, um, at, you know, at the simplest level, you look at like a Minecraft and you say, wow, okay, you know, how, how immersive that is for so many kids. But when you go to something like a Unity, these are like the most powerful creation tools basically in history. It's extraordinary. Anything you can imagine you can create. And so we look at this and say, how do you enable the next generation to be creators in these amazing tools? And with AI coming in, you can, you know, A, build more amazing things, and B, lower the floor for people to be able to step into these amazing tools. Um, and so when I think immersive learning, I, I, I think these days less about the immersive element of a game I'm playing, and I think a lot more about just how immersive it is to be in a state of flow where you are just totally immersed in creating something that you're in love with. All right, the state of flow. What about you, Cindy? Well, I'm going to build off of that, because I think for us, one of the key principles when we think about immersive learning is learning by doing. That the, the, the learner is immersed in an environment where they're able to explore. They're either tr trying to solve a problem, a challenge. And it's in a very nonlinear way. They're able to, to, to seek out those problems. And um, it's very self-directed and deeply personalized. All right. Deeply personalized, self-directed. I'm actually going to skip you, Doug. 
<laughs> we'll just kind of continue on an age I, I don't know how I got in front of the line. I don't know. <laughs> Um, so when I think about immersive learning, I think about experiential learning. So kind of playing off of what Cindy was saying as well, especially when it comes to the world of competitive video gaming or esports is in an educational setting. How do you get those students to learn without realizing that they're learning? How do you get them to learn the different skills that go along with setting up an esports tournament without them recognizing that they're actually taking a master class in project management? Mm -hmm. so, uh, and for me, it's a it's a little simpler. We you know we deliver training for tradespeople, electricians, HVAC, plumbers, etc., and we immerse them in the environment doing their job. So they're going to carry a virtual multimeter, be fixing a heat pump, or on top of a building fixing a rooftop unit, etc. So the immersion is really mimicking the on-the-job performance in a in a game-like environment. All right, so really diverse perspectives on this one word of immersive. Um, I wanted to get a little bit clear in the minds of our audience just how your innovations work. Um, so Danielle, if you could kick us off and just describe the space and place of how your customers are using your products and then how that informs how you think about design and impact. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, eSports, like I was mentioning, competitive video gaming, and I have the privilege to be the eSports manager at CDW, which is one of the largest technology resellers um, in the world. And, and we really cover it from beginning to end. So we cover everything from um, design, space design, how do you want to use this programmatically to the hardware, to the furniture, to the support and the platforms. Uh, so as far as building it into the educational environment, we see so many schools, both K-12 and higher ed, that really want to have that experiential learning and then also want to do something to generate that sense of community and that sense of belonging for these students. So that's really why we're in it, is to help support our K-12 and collegiate customers and, and really support just students feeling better about belonging to something. Not every kid is a band kid or an athlete or a debate kid, et cetera. So having esports there, having competitive video gaming, whether they compete or not, many of the students that get involved in the esports clubs want to be managers. They want to be shoutcasters, doing you know the commentary after the game or during the game. There are so many students that just want to be a part of gaming and the gaming ecosystem. And esports on their campus, whether they're in fourth grade or whether they're a PhD student doing research on it, allows them to do that. How did you guys get into this business? Was it a proactive strategy move or were you being pulled in by your customers and then what type of customers? So it's interesting because I, I've, I've been the national esports manager at CDW for six months, but I've been working in esports for around six years. I was at Dell before as a high ed strategist. Um, I was dabbling in it a little bit when I was an IT director at the University of Colorado Boulder. And so about five to six years ago, we really saw an uptick in Honestly, if I'm going to be truthful, the amount of hype about esports. But then once the esports programs got started on educational campuses, they recognized, oh, this is a big thing. This is something that these students are getting a lot of benefit out of. So we started seeing more and more of our educational customers um, from both companies that I've worked for requesting gaming machines. And typically that back at that particular time period for a manufacturer or a reseller, that wasn't always able to be offered. Those were consumer devices, those were not commercial or public devices available to educational accounts, but the more requests we got for it, the more we started to open up the product lines and say, okay, we need to support this. And um, like you said, I'm very grateful to CDW as a company to recognize that this is more than just somebody's side gig. This is actually something that we should have a, a small team devoted to so that we can support all of those educational customers in these endeavors. Thanks so much. Doug, what about you? So um, ours is uh, an online learning platform for a group that typically hasn't been treated very well by the ed tech community. I'm not pointing any fingers, though. Um, but this, uh, we got about 500 hours um, of learning. And it's, like I said, in the skill trades I mentioned. And it's used mostly by employers. About 75% of our business is employers. Um, about 2,000 employers. Everything from, you know, Sally's Heating and Air up through CBRE and Lowe's. So it's used as a career progression 
tool for them to, to learn skills. They might start as a tech level one at a service, as a service contractor in, in the HVAC industry, and they're trying to advance their skills and their career. So that's where we find it in the employer space. Uh, and then in the workforce development space and in the education space, which is a little newer to us, we have a probably about 300 customers in that space. That might be post-secondary. That could be a vocational trade school. It could be a high school. And more interestingly, now we're getting in more in the workforce development world where we're taking folks with no skill and really making them employable in these trades industries where there's jobs in demand in their community. And so that's been very impactful watching us really impact lives where they just had nowhere to go. Maybe they're underemployed or unemployed and, and meanwhile down the street that plumbing shop is begging for a technician because you know what is a pretty massive skills gap. So you'll find our platform in those environments as well. And is your platform headsets or mobile or web? Or yeah, good question. So w these immersive simulations, and, and the whole catalog's not immersive sims, but the, the sims are very much the pillars of the catalog, and frankly, it's been our calling card and the reason in the last five years that the, you know, the, the business has taken off because we often hear, geez, my techs will actually use this, right? And it's been that game-like quality that's really, uh, really drawn them in. Um, and now I forget the question. Yes. Oh, yeah. And so we, that platform is available on all devices. We, we decided in 2016 the VR devices were phenomenal, particularly for you know, mimicking this hands-on work. But we were just nervous about adoption rate of that hardware. And so now when we build and develop a simulation and we hit publish, we don't care if you consume it on a tablet or right through the browser or in VR. And you know, we love when people are willing to go the extra step with VR because it is incredibly powerful for retention and, um, and the power of learning there. But very few of our customers, if you can imagine, are really ready to take on VR. These are, you know, these are, this is old industry, you know, and now we're asking them to take new technology. So they love the online stuff, and that's really where we get them excited, and some will graduate to, to using the VR as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Cindy, what about you? Um, so I'm just curious, how many here have heard of the George Lucas Educational Foundation? Okay, great. And you probably have heard of us because of Edutopia, which is what pretty much over the course of the past 30 plus years we've been producing. Um, but I'm here today representing a new initiative that is about a year old. Um, we don't yet have a product out in the market. We're in the early stage prototyping, um, but it's very exciting for us because we're, we're basically, we just completed a decade of research in partnership with top education researchers at universities all around the country to validate project-based learning. And the research showed across the grade levels, K through 12, that project-based learning can be a pedagogical approach to improve learning outcomes and create greater engagement. And, um, and it's fantastic. The challenge is that to do project-based learning, it's a heavy lift for teachers. It requires a lot of professional development to change the way they teach. And so we look at this great learning opportunity for kids and not as many kids have access to it. And so what we're trying to do with Lucas Learning, which is our new simulations division, is to take the principles that, that were validated in the research for project-based learning and apply them to simulations. And our hope is that this is gonna be a way to bring project-based learning experiences into classrooms to make it easier for the teacher so more teachers will be able to have access to that opportunity. We're very early, we're gonna start with the eighth grade and, and we are not going to initially build for headsets, if that was gonna be your question. <laughs> um, so our, our goal is accessibility and so we're designing for platforms that we know are in most schools, Chromebooks, iPads, um, but we are going to future-proof because we do believe that the power of a full 3D immersive environment is it's really exciting and it will hopefully, as prices drop, be more accessible. And do you have specific subjects that you're targeting? So we're starting with the eighth grade, as I mentioned, and our initial focus is on anatomy, but our plan is to go into several subject areas. And I should recognize um, our chief technology officer, Joel Sadler, is here in the front. Um, so he is really the guy that, as part of a core team, working, and what's also really important about what we're doing is our intention is not to be a distributor 
of these simulations, it's to partner, to partner with um, companies that will hopefully help move the market to bring these immersive sims into schools. So we see it across grade levels, initially starting with the eighth grade and in several subject areas. And it's been a long time coming, I understand. Yes. A long passion. This isn't a new, we're jumping on a new technology. Yes, yes. So, so George Lucas was bored in school, starting at about the eighth grade, and it wasn't until he went to college to pursue his passion filmmaking that he realized he loved to learn. And so he looked back and he was like, why couldn't I have felt this way in middle school? And he recognizes that there are other kids like him that could be more engaged. And so it's something that through the years of our foundation, he's often talked about and thought about. And the other person I should reference, there are only two of, two other, two, two of our team members here, but is Steve Arnold, who co-founded our foundation, you should just wave your hand, with George. And Steve has especially heard through the years George talk about this desire. Um, Finishing the research and seeing this incredible approach that every kid in every kid in every classroom should be able to participate in project-based learning, seeing the barriers to entry, and also post-pandemic, there's a lot more accessibility with tech and schools, and so we're feeling really optimistic about bringing this forward now. And I think the the other key thing too um, is that you. You'd, I think of Edutopia as just a staple in a classroom and a staple for teachers. I think you guys, I heard 14 million monthly. Average of 14 yeah. million a month, yeah. Yeah, reading. And so similar, I think, to CDW, we have these like mainstream for education companies who are really starting to invest in immersive and see the promise of the outcomes, which is great. All right, Matt. So I'll start with the question of how you, uh, how you got there, because I love that question. Um, <clears throat> So about 10 years ago, I started a company which um, was really focused on device and internet access in emerging markets. And the question was, how do you get like, education and the tools to everyone everywhere? Um, and in doing that, um, I, I was always thinking about how do you get the education piece and not just the tools piece to everyone. And in the process, I would interview our engineers and ask, like, how did you learn to code? How did you learn to code? And it turns out I got the same answer almost every time. Can anyone guess? The answer was games. I loved games, and then I discovered I could hack my games, and it was more fun to hack them than to play them. <laughs> and it turns out that's how Elon learned, that's how Mark Zuckerberg learned, that's how Google's AI lead, it's just how kind of everybody learns. And then usually what we found is that they went into a community, and then they started learning through peer-to-peer, -peer, and then from there they flowed in, into, they, they, they had mentors along the way. And so this insight of like, well, what if you built a game where the whole idea was that everything could be hackable, um, came to us, and I partnered with the team that uh, built Minecraft EDU, and we built a game um, called The Endless Mission, and the idea was, well, let's make everything hackable. And then we ran out of money. <laughs> um, and then we realized that it was actually, like, the way to build that game, the, the, the sheer volume of quest lines that you would need to teach all things code was just so vast that $100 million, $500 million wouldn't do it. But if you could have the youth be the ones who were building the quest lines, you'd get the game. But more importantly, they'd learn more by building the game than they would by playing the game. And so that's when we realized that the real value was them building the games. And so we pivoted, um, totally altered um, our strategy around everything, which was to say, like, well, what if we built a youth game making studio where we provide community and we provide mentorship and we provide scaffolded tools so that people can build games collaboratively together? We also looked at it and said, okay, well, some people are interested in engineering, but other people say, I want to be the artist or the designer or the project manager or the marketer. And the real working world involves the collaboration across disciplines. And so we think of, like in games, skill trees. And those, those branch out into things like sound design. And even if you look at art, art is 3D modeling. 3D modeling is mechanical engineering, industrial design, architecture. So like, you can train almost all the disciplines of innovation or entrepreneurship in the process of building a piece of software called a game. And so we scaffold mostly college and high school students. We've started from sort of the top and we're moving our way down. Um, and the idea is to allow them to build their own games, but also allow them opportunities to work on bigger games 
than the games they could build on their own. So learning from the open source Linux world and how this, this operating system we had built and how incredible it is to build really complex pieces of software collaboratively, we look at this and say, well, what if games were built that way? And if you build games that way, then you offer the opportunity for a apprenticeship where someone who's on their learning journey can go join a 3D modeling contest for the art assets, can go code game mechanics, can go build levels. And so really what we're trying to do is almost bridge the gap and be a community that sits in the intersection of the learners and those who are building real games, which creates more learning. So is it, are you in school and out of school, and how do you think through space and play? Yeah, great question. So uh, we think the learning and the activity takes place mostly in the hours outside of school. Like There's only so much you can learn in an hour a week or a couple times a week. But schools are great distribution channels. You know, In other words, if you can get a kid engaged in a school and make something that's so compelling, like you know, imagine your homework is like, go play Minecraft, kids. <laughs> Um, and by the way, like, I mean, uh, you know, props to Unity. We, we run programs, and you ask the kids who go through the, the programs, what do you like better, Unity or Minecraft? It's mind-blowing to think that they would say Unity, because, wow, Unity is so complicated. But the answer is, once they know how to use Unity, the answer is Unity, because it's so much more powerful. And so when you get youth hooked in the classroom, and they're doing something with their friends, they like doing it, and they get kind of committed to the thing they're building, all of a sudden you find them doing it outside of the classroom. Exciting. I didn't realize that. <laughs> they would actually say Unity. More popular than Minecraft. <laughs> um, so Matt's always nudging me in these prep calls that I should talk a little bit about Unity, um, just to give you those of you who aren't aware of it, an overview. Um, so we started the education work at Unity about seven years ago. Um, really the focus initially was around high school university students learning Unity and then entering into the job market. Um, as you guys probably know, Unity is a public company. Um, revenue is a key part of what we're driving for. So we're really funneling the future creator customer base. Um, we have grown, uh, on average, about 45% year over year. So we now have about a, over a million students who are actively learning Unity, getting into certifications, and then moving into jobs. Um, what we actually love even more is that many of those students decide not to continue careers in Unity, but those exact skills have set them up for careers in 21st century jobs. Um, and then in addition to that, just as a full circle, when you look at Interplay and all of you um, in this room who are building on Unity, we have a very robust program called Unity for Humanity that then provides grants and support to all of you professional creators um, who are creating for education, healthcare, sustainability, and, and impact. All right, so uh, leading and clo or closing with impact, that's actually our next question. I'm curious how all of you think about learning impact, um, how you measure it, and how you design for it. Anybody want to jump in first? I'll start, sure. Um, so for us, it's, it's really easy to measure. It's skill acquisition, right? Can somebody couldn't troubleshoot a, a, you know, a split residential AC system, and now they can. They can identify one of the potential 35 faults they might find in the field. And then companies will often tie career progression to that. They'll actually be able to measure. Often when they're early in their career, they can predict like when are they ready to the roll their own truck to start doing these service calls or handling a facility maintenance call. So for ours, it's like you can, we have assessments throughout, whether it's some quizzing or 3D simulation assessments where they have to actually get a troubleshooting call and go solve the problem. So it's, uh, it's a pretty easy way to measure. It gets a, on the, on the workforce development and the education space, it's a little different. It's, you know, do, can they pass a certification exam to then, you know, become a HVAC tech with a EPA certificate or an OSHA certificate, et cetera. So there's some prep work getting them ready to sit for those exams as well. So like real basic, like skill assessment, skill assessment. So there's not a, you know, whole lot, it's not a lot more complicated than that in what we do. Are you able to track um, income, changes in income or earnings? It's a little tricky for us because um, typically once they're inside of the, the company, like we'll hear anecdotally that they're using this for career progression or we'll have case studies where, 
if you, you know, they'll show, if somebody shows the command of a, a multimeter, they get a dollar fifty an hour more on their, you know, uh, on their hourly wage, et cetera. So we'll see stuff like that. But we don't, we're not connected to their, you know, ADP systems. Right, right. So we don't know exactly what's happening with their income. Yeah. yeah. But it sounds like from the focus on how do we get them to acquire the skills, sustain, retain them in the program, get the certification, you've decided that an immersive learning approach is driving the greatest outcome. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. I mean, there's, uh, if you go to, you know, conferences around industrial or, or skilled trades, like there's a massive skills gap. And so just being able to, one, attract people, like that's been really helpful for these companies because by building a foundational training program on our, you know, on using things like Unity, you've got a 19-year-old said, that looks like an interesting career. And so that's been, it's allowed a lot of employers to broaden their candidate pool. So we're seeing a lot of, you know, we're seeing a lot of growth based on that and a, and a lot of thanks to us because they were frustrated with this skills gap and they're saying, how do I get the kids to be interested in these career trades, which, you know, like my generation was told, you have to go to a four-year institution, you know, don't, don't do that line of work. And so now we're trying to undo that a little bit and it's nice, you're seeing some real tailwinds in the national education system as started early as ninth grade saying, look, not everyone should be thinking about a four-year you know, liberal arts degree. Let's look at a lot of other paths, and we're getting those calls now. You know, Different state directors saying, hey, how could you help us design a state program that would allow the eighth graders, ninth graders, start seeing other career options in the electrical, mechanical, industrial space, and what kind of things could we deliver to them to keep them engaged, and, and the gaming's a big part of that. Fascinating. Anybody, go ahead. I'll, I'll jump in just really quickly. Um, you know, has anybody ever been to an esports event? Yeah, a few hands. Yes, I'm so excited. Okay, I didn't know what I was going to get when I asked that question. So, anybody who has been to an event or has even seen an event or even maybe has put together any kind of an event where you have multiple computers connected to the internet at the same time, you know that there's going to be issues, there's going to be problems, there's going to be cables that don't work, the internet's going to go down, the game server is going to be dead for some reason. Um, so those students that are a part of the esports programs at these schools and universities, they're getting that hands-on knowledge of how do I work through these problems? How do I troubleshoot? How do I handle something when something doesn't go right? They're also learning how to reach out to people. They have to reach out to local businesses, to vendors, to ask to borrow equipment, to get prizes. So there are just so many things that will be useful as professional competencies in their future that they're learning and that they're doing just because they really want to put on this gaming event. And it goes back to that experiential learning aspect where they're learning how to be project managers. They're learning how to be AV technicians. They're learning how to be an A-plus certified hardware specialist without taking the test. So to me, those are the amazing impacts besides community and some of the learning that they can have in there, but just having those career pathway skills and being able to be more well-rounded employees because of what they did in high school. So um, I would say at our foundation, when we think about 21st century skills, there are a couple that we believe are fundamental, that all kids need to learn how to find information, how to assess the quality of the information, how to apply it creatively to solve problems, and how to work collaboratively. And when we look at these core, core skills in our work with the simulations, we're trying to ensure that we're building in these opportunities so students can hone those skills. And then, of course, it'll be tied to the academics. So depending on the partner that we're working with, we want to make sure that they are learning, in, in, their learning is increasing, improving through the, through the process. So I'll give you my answer, which uh, the learning team won't like, um, <laughs> which is, that when you see people experience the process of building a game and then they go and discover more and more of the skills that allow them to go deeper and deeper into the skill tree, like you see the person who's like, you know, just a, like a, you know, a, a, a character artist and all of a sudden they discover that they can learn a little bit of code to do a little bit more art and all of a sudden they're excited about learning code or on the other side, the engineer was like, I have no interest in design, but there's no designer on the team, so I guess I've got to do it, and it turns out I like design. Like, for me, it's about the engagement and seeing that unfurl. 
And like there are participants who've gone through our program that like I remember early in the process them being like I'm in Unity for the first time and I'm teaching my two coworkers and the two coworkers are Emirati women who've never seen GitHub before and they're all of a sudden learning GitHub and then next thing you know like I speak to him and he's starting a game studio in a remote place in the UAE like how cool is that? And so the thing that excites me is seeing the skill trees evolve in fuzzy ways. Mm -hmm. Institutions want to have an assessment attached to it and a number attached to it so that you can, and you have to have that, and so that's why we have wonderful learning leads who, you know, the head of Minecraft, or sorry, the head of uh, Microsoft Games and Learning just joined us, the person who built um, the Rochester Institute of Technology's game program, some really extraordinary people to then say, okay, now how do you assess every step along that skill tree? How do you create, um, you know, the, the archipelago, as they call it, where you can assess every step along the way? But for me, the exciting part is seeing the passion that's just infused as people branch out into directions that have nothing to do with assessment, it has more to do with passion, and then when you assess it, it turns out they've learned something because they're passionate about it. Self-directed, yeah. I'm gonna combine our last two questions, so we've got time to hear from all of you. Um, so scale and sustainability, business sustainability, um, are kind of the, the holy grail um, as we look at these businesses so that you can continue making impact. We've also seen massive um, you know, evolutions in tech with generative AI. Um, I think Oculus, or sorry, Meta, <laughs> um, their headset announcement this week and just really wanting to get it as low cost as possible for K-12 schools. Um, so I'm curious how all of you are thinking through scale and business sustainability um, with all of these innovations and um, is it gonna make it easier and do you think you can make greater impact? I love how everybody just looked at me. Um, so, yeah, it, it's no secret really that there has been over the past two to three years what we call an esports winter, um, especially from the pro side of things, the professional organizations, um, kind of going back to that comment I made where a few years ago it was kind of hype um, before it became a reality. Uh, so many organizations were out there trying to make their name, but depending solely on sponsorship dollars. And then when you have a recession and things like that, all of that dries up. So there is a huge motion in the esports community of how do we make this sustainable? And to be frank, like collegiate esports is carrying the esports community on its back right now. Um, the, the games, the viewership numbers on Twitch, et cetera. So everybody is kind of looking at collegiate esports and saying, okay, how do we make sure that this stays good and it doesn't necessarily go through some of the same growing pains that the professional esports scene went through? We're also seeing you know, more and more K-12s get into esports and looking at other games than just kind of the traditional you know, top five games that are there, we're looking at Minecraft, we're looking at Roblox, we're looking at all of these other games that you can bring in for those younger levels to help them get those proficiencies and those skills skills and trying to really build more of a sustainable ecosystem that's focused around community and learning as opposed to who can give us the most sponsorship dollars. Yeah, for us, I'm not sure how you're defining scale, but I know what scale wasn't, and that was, you know, for six or seven years, the, the company was about eight or nine people sort of flat fighting, a, a, you know, an uphill battle. In the last five years, it's been very different, and now we're almost 200 employees, and we had hundreds of customers and we have probably 300,000 users on the platform you know regularly so now we're really having an impact in our scale at this point in the next stage is really about distribution it's not about technology right it's about uh, a group that for the most part hasn't had a lot of good ed tech to be working with and so just getting on their phones getting on their tablets is making a huge difference for them so when something like you know Apple's vision pro comes like that excites the sort of tech forward crowd, but it's not gonna really affect our business. And But you, you like to see it, because I think there's certainly like, as long as the hardware companies keep advancing that, the idea of this getting closer and closer to really one-on-one -on -one mentor in, a, in an immersive environment, which is incredibly way, to, you know, incredible way to learn anything, but certainly a skilled trades. Like, I'd love to see it, and you know, I, 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 every year I hope, is this the next step? Is this the next step? Let's keep going. Um, I mentioned earlier partnerships, so um, that's obviously a critical part as we're thinking about scale, finding the right partners where these simulations can be, play an important role in their future offerings to schools. 
Um, we also are looking at tech and making sure that we're you know, targeting tech that's more accessible and available. And then another scalability just area of focus for us is what I mentioned about the teacher. How can we make the job of the teacher easier so the teacher can bring these rich experiences into the classroom and be able to play a meaningful role and not be completely overwhelmed and juggling way too much? Um, so in 2010, when I started like Endless V1, focused on emerging markets, the world was in a pretty good place. Um, and my goal was to lift up those who didn't have. Um, the world looks really different today and in many ways a lot scarier and in many ways, wow, the things that you can do with AI and in, wow, if everyone's left behind, the world that we'll have when no one has jobs, like we don't know if it's gonna be a better or worse world and I believe the most important thing that um, I can spend my life solving is trying to make sure that A, people have the skills to get jobs in that world and B, people have the skills to solve all the other problems because there are a lot of them and so, Everything that we do is about how you scale it and mass. Um, we are a company, and we are, I'll just say actually on, on, on AI, and AI just accelerated all of that. <laughs> and um, we often talk about how there's using AI to teach, but there's also teaching people to use AI. Mm -hmm. And you have to do the latter because that's what jobs will be. And so whether that's art or design or engineering or management or marketing, all of the disciplines will all be infused with this piece of software called AI. And so the act of teaching people to use those tools, we believe, is a really effective way of teaching people to use those tools for the thing that they're excited about games. In terms of how we think about scaling it, um, Endless V1, focused on device and internet access, tried to be a company that had impact. And we went out of business. Um, and it's now a foundation. And we went out of business because we tried to do both in one. And so um, with Endless Studios, we've looked at it and said, we're gonna separate the mission impact and the financial goals um, as two totally separate things. And so there's uh, a company called Endless Studios and it is chasing profit. Um, and we have some really exciting deal opportunities that are highly unscalable, but highly profitable. And it allows us to then pay for the core engine that can then be democratized. <clears throat> Separately, we are about to announce the Endless Foundation, um, but it's really the Endless, o the, the team that's been working there for a decade on device and internet access mm -hmm. is really gearing to say, and now how do we take all of the things that Endless Studios is doing and take it to places that wouldn't have access to it otherwise? The Seychelles, uh, you know, refugee camps. We're working in Uruguay. I was just there a week ago. Um, I, I two people actually in the audience that I was just with in, in Uruguay <laughs> a week ago. Um, because they're interested in potentially rolling it out to every kid in the country. But they don't have money, the way they say it is, you know, we, we won't make you rich, but we'll make you famous. And I'm like, but as a startup, I gotta be rich, I gotta pay for my bills. But the answer is yes, we can do something. El Salvador, an amazing country, what's happening in El Salvador, wants to roll out this program to every kid in the country, and they wanna go to like fifth graders because by sixth grade every kid's dropped out of school and they see this as a way of keeping kids in school and giving them skills so that even if they drop out, they've got skills. So these are places that a company couldn't go, but because we have a foundation, we can go. And so we've solved that in version two by, by separating them. Exciting. All right. we've got. Two minutes for one question. <laughs> Who can, there we go. Uh, you talk about educational innovation. If we build such innovation, how do we get it to a platform where users actually use it? Uh, so we're talking about education innovation. How do we, we get it, it, how do we distribute it? How do we get it to the users in a way that they'll use it? Anybody wanna jump in? Okay. You've gotta make them great. It's, that, it's gotta be good enough that it competes with the consumer games that they have, Fortnite and Roblox and all of these things. It has to, otherwise they won't. Um, and so, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why education games have not taken off. A big one, I actually used to say, no, it's not budget. It is budget. <laughs> I take back my prior statements. That, um, and that's why I think when you have people collaborate together to build, like imagine if you have a team of five people, what you can build. Well, imagine if everyone in this room collaborated to build a game, even if it was a few hours a week, with, you know, with good stewardship of professional studios, you'll build great games. 
And if you look at some of the most successful games in history, they're actually incredibly powerful learning games, Civilization and SimCity and Spore and Minecraft and uh, you know, so, so uh, Assassin's Creed, so many of the most successful consumer games in history are great learning engines. Um, there's a great story about someone who was tested on the Renaissance having only played Assassin's Creed and he did better <laughs> than the people who had just graduated from like the AP history class on that. So, so if you can direct swarms at building these sorts of games, we believe you can create really engaging games. So, so actually, I should have announced, no, so just uh, yesterday we announced a, a games and learning lab with ASU. ASU is for nine years in a row the most innovative university um, in, in the country, and obviously ASU GSV um, it, it is one of the uh, many examples of that, how that innovation shows up. And so we've, uh, I just came from a meeting with Michael Crow where we were talking about um, all of the ways of harnessing games, um, both the creation side and the play side. So we're very, very lucky to, to work with them, but the way we think of it is like all institutions should be partners just generally together with each other because the problem is, is it's not competition. The problem is, is, is the fact that we've got to engage a lot of kids to teach them these skills and we have to do it quickly because we got some big problems to solve. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks to our great Thank panel. you.